Welcome to my library. I'm glad you saw fit to join me this day here in the library as I reflect upon someone significant in my life, Ely Parker, the Seneca Indian second or tribal chief, in fact, the principal chief of the Six Nations. And I'd like to talk a bit about Ely Parker. He was born in 1828. He doesn't know the specific day. In fact, he's fond of joking that he's like Flossie in Uncle Tom's Cabin. He doesn't have a birthday. He was never born. He never lived and so forth. But he was born in 1828 on the Tonawanda Reservation in western New York of uh, Seneca Indians. He's not a full-blooded Seneca Indian because his grandmother was white. She was a uh, captive uh, pioneer girl that was taken captive, raised by the Seneca, married a Seneca, and uh, that's his grandmother. So one-fourth of Ely and his family, uh, his brothers and sisters, is actually white. So he's not quite a full-blooded Seneca Indian. He had uh, five brothers and one sister. So with the seven uh, Parkers, the house was a lively one. His father was a successful uh, Indian uh, some, of some rank in the tribe, and his mother was very well educated as well. He went to school at uh, a Baptist school just outside the reservation there and uh, then he went to Yates Academy and learned to speak English fairly well, but he was motivated later to learn to speak it even better because he was uh, asked to interpret for the church one morning. He's very active in his church, and he realized that he couldn't, couldn't do it. He didn't have as good a command of English as his fellow tribesmen thought that he did. So he resolved to become as fluent in, in English as a white man, and he did indeed become so. He uh, later went to Yates Academy and studied, did well. Uh, he was industrious. He was trying to fit into the mold of, of an Indian in a white man's society. But early on, he began to fulfill the dream that his mother had four months before he was born. She had a dream that uh, a, a huge hand, it was it swept away all of the clouds and snow in a snowstorm above her home. And in the clearing sky, there was a rainbow that reached from the Onondaga, or correction, the Tonawanda Reservation across and into ending in the former Indian agent's uh, home, Judge Granger. So the rainbow went from reservation into the village nearby, but it was suddenly there was a, a break in the rainbow. She went and had it interpreted by a dream interpreter there in the tribe, and he told her that she was going to have a son and the rainbow indicated that he was going to be a great man and a leader. And the fact that it went from the reservation to Judge Granger's home, the former Indian agent, meant that his life would begin in the reservation with the red man, but he would die in a white man's world, and the uh, white man's ground would fold his body. And uh, the break in the rainbow meant that he would lead two distinct lives. And as it turns out, that's what happened with Ely Parker. And he pronounces it Ely, not Eli. Uh, Ely to rhyme with freely. E-L-I is Eli. He, he spells his E-L-Y. But at about age 18, he had already been to Albany, New York, and been an interpreter for his tribe with the governor of New York. And in fact, had been to, as a teenager, he'd been to Washington City 
to interpret for the uh, Seneca and the Six Nation tribes with the president there in trying to preserve their reservation, which uh, was uh, being attempted to being taken away from them illegally by a land development company. But at age 18, he went to Ellicottsville, New York, and began to read law. He, uh, within a year or so, he was able to pass the bar exam and became a, a practicing lawyer until uh, the state of New York denied him a license to practice law because they said he was not an American citizen. So, even though he had demonstrated some brilliance in his legal work, he could not practice law. He cast about himself and uh, was urged to get a job with the Genesee County Canal System. And he did. He started out working in manual labor, worked up to draftsman, and then got into a supervisory capacity and took some coursework at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York, and actually became an accomplished practical engineer. Rose in uh, rank uh, to substantial position with the uh, state of New York canal system and uh, was ultimately, though, bumped out of the job because a white man uh, was preferred for the job and he found himself again out of work, gone through law and couldn't practice law because he was not a citizen uh, and couldn't uh, practice engineering because of the prejudice and he wasn't a white man, he was an Indian, so he couldn't uh, be an engineer. But the Treasury Department hired him through some people he'd met working with the canal system with the county and the state in New York, and they hired him to be a supervising engineer in, well, first they sent him to Detroit. He worked there briefly, uh, just a few months. Then they sent him to Galena, Illinois, in 1857, and he was charged with building a custom house and a uh, new post office there and a marine hospital, and he built all three and did quite well. Now, along the way, he had become a Mason. When he was 19 years old, he had gone into the Masonic Lodge in New York and became very enamored of masonry, its precepts and teachings and practices. He often said he felt most truly equal and at home in a lodge of his brothers. And there was no prejudice for the red man in a Masonic Lodge. And he rose uh, all the way to lofty ranks of uh, administration and office in masonry. In fact, when he went uh, to Galena, he became worshipful master of the Galena Lead Mine Lodge and the lodge in Buffalo, New York, the Ely Parker Lodge number 1002 is named in his honor. He was always very active in masonry and in all manner of offices and positions. And being in Galena, there was a great deal of prejudice against him. And uh, he found solace in the lodge. But while he was at uh, Galena, he met John Rawlins, whom he called Black John. And he called him Black John because of his black hair, his black eyes, his dark black beard. Uh, and he teased him and called him Black John. They used to play cards together a lot. Of course, Rawlins had become an attorney, and uh, uh, they knew each other in town. He also met me when I was working as a clerk there with Grant and Perkins on Main Street in Galena, Illinois, and he was the lawyer for our leather store. We didn't have much to say to each other. Uh, I was retiring. He made a comment later on, though, that when I would be working behind the counter, when someone came in the front door, that I would suddenly find a reason to be in the back of the store, even perhaps at the back door. That I was not a salesman, not much of a talker, but even less of a salesman. 
Well, he had uh, developed his interest in masonry along the way of becoming an attorney, becoming an engineer, and very good at both. Uh, became an extremely well-read man, was known, was even teased and called by many of his friends as the encyclopedia because he knew so much about so many different topics, but he was not a braggart. In fact, he was very quiet, even reticent, but when asked and when engaged in the conversation, he would speak freely and gain the reputation of being the encyclopedia. He had tried also to get into or gotten into uh, the uh, militia there in, he was in Dubuque, Iowa briefly, and uh, in Illinois there at Galena in the Joe Davis County, and he got some some military experience, so to speak. And when the war started, he tried to get into the army. <clears throat> and he couldn't because he was an Indian. In fact, he even appealed directly <clears throat> to Secretary uh, Seward, who told him bluntly, this is a white man's war and it will be fought by white men and we don't need Indians. He went back to the reservation in uh, Tonawanda, the New York there, western New York, and became a farmer, though his heart was definitely not in it. And for two years, he wanted to be in the war. His brother got in uh, through circuitous routes and did quite well, distinguished himself. One of his brothers did. and. Uh, he finally had a friend of his that he'd met in his engineering endeavors, a John Smith, who had from Galena, who'd gone in the army, risen to a brigadier general, and he sent for Ely to come join him as his adjutant general. And uh, he wrote a praising recommendation to the War Department for Ely about how intelligent he was, how capable he was, how efficient he was and that he was badly needed as an adjutant on the staff of Brigadier General Smith. The only thing he didn't tell the War Department was that Ely was an Indian. And uh, he left for Vicksburg, Mississippi on May the 26th of 1863, or I'm sorry, June the 26th of 1863. And he got there on July the 7th, well of course, Vicksburg had fallen to me on July the 4th. And he became busily engaged with uh, working with John Smith and learning how to be an adjutant general. And he was quite brilliant at it. Very organized man. Very far-thinking man. Insightful man. And in fact, I moved him over to my staff and uh, at the rank of captain. When I went to Chattanooga in uh, October of 63, I took Ely with me. But Ely had caught the ague, the fever, and was desperately, in fact, he was delirious with fever, had been just before we left. And uh, in fact, it was felt he would die uh, quickly. He didn't. He recovered, very weak for a few days but was with me through the Chattanooga campaign. In fact, wrote some very stirring commentary about being with me on Orchard Knob for the Battle of Lookout Mountain, and then a day or so later, the Battle of Missionary Ridge, which really was the first time he'd ever seen combat, even though when I rode to check on forward positions, he was with me and was thus subject to danger. And he made the observations that I was always in, at the front, leading from the front, and had no apparent concern for my own well-being. That I was not reckless or brash, but I went where I needed to go, and I was in front of my troops, which I was very grateful that he had that observation. He went on with me through the uh, campaign of the last year of the war from becoming Lieutenant General to the surrender, and he was with me at the surrender. Ted Bowers was going to write the uh, surrender terms in ink, and he was, from the hard ride to get there, from the, the tenseness of the moment, 
his hand shook and he said, I, I, I can't do this. He had torn up three or four sheets of paper and uh, he said, Ely, I can't do this. You'll have to write it. So Parker slid into the chair, very calm, always very calm, always spoke in a soft voice, never rose his, uh, his voice, uh, was known to be very deliberate in his speech and mannerisms of speaking. And he wrote the terms of surrender that I gave General Lee. And the next day, in fact, on the uh, 10th of April, I rode out to meet with General Lee and to try to persuade him to order all Confederate arms to, to be laid down, which he demurred. But Ely was seated beside me on his horse next to me, listening to, and taking notes of uh, taking in what we said and wrote some orders for me sitting on a stump next to where we were before we left and went back to Washington City. He worked with me for the next four years during the Johnson administration, went out west several times, became very well known as a negotiator and a peacemaker. The Indians came to quickly trust him and he advocated that they be uh, undisturbed on their reservations, that they get education, because he always felt profoundly that the solution to any and all problems that the Indians had could be solved with education, a strong, deep education. And he advocated for that consistently. He, in fact, when we came back from the surrender, he met with President Lincoln at the Executive Mansion on Good Friday, April the 14th. Yes, that day, uh, April the 14th, Ely Parker did meet and, and talked at some length with President Lincoln. He had also met President Polk in 1846. He met Henry Clay in 1848, Franklin Pierce uh, when he was a president, uh, and he, he was always meeting lofty personages. He led something of a charmed life in that manner. When I became president in March of 69, one of the first things that I did was to appoint Ely as the Commissioner for Indian Affairs, which was a breathtaking move on my part because he was an Indian and that was very controversial. He was the first Indian to actually hold the office of the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, which was something of a, a shock. And he held that office for two years, did quite well. We made the transition from uh, independent Indian agents who were bilking and cheating the Indians and becoming wealthy from it to about half of them were Quakers and other ministers, and the other half were army officers. And it was moved to the, the Commission of Indian Affairs was moved to the Department of the Interior. We felt it should be under the, the War Department, but it was moved under Jacob Cox as Secretary of the Interior. And he, he had the position for two years. It was, conditions were dramatically improved for Indians overall. He's fond of saying that in the two years from, uh, I think, April of 69 to August of 71 when he resigned, there were no Indian wars, no Indian fighting to speak of, nothing, no wars. It was a very calm period. He got uh, into a controversy with one of the civilian commissioners on the Bureau to oversee the Indian Affairs. I think there were 15 people on it. And in the legislation that was passed, the rules and the regs that were set up, he there had to be approval, and it was good for the accountability of any and all goods purchased by the United States that were sent west to the Indians. But on a one particular occasion, it was getting late in the summer, and the food stuffs by the ton that had to be sent to the tribes had not yet been ordered. Ely went, I think, to, I think to Philadelphia to consummate the contract, and he didn't get the approval of the committee. 
because of the contingency of the matter. If action wasn't taken immediately, those people would not have food for the winter. He didn't do anything illegal. There was no fraud involved. He did the best thing that had to be done in the circumstances, feeling sure that he it would be fine when the paperwork came through. Well, it set wrong with the Mr. Welsh, one of the members, who uh, accused him of graft and corruption and had a, a trial brought before, investigation brought before the House. And it was rather lengthy, and Ely was found to be completely innocent of any and all charges. He was criticized, though, because he didn't follow procedure, even though he thoroughly explained why he did not follow procedure and had all the receipts appropriate to what he had done, so it's obvious there was no dishonesty. But he had uh, chagrined Mr. Welsh, and it cost him dearly. After that uh, investigation exonerated him, he resigned. So in 1871, he is free of the federal government. He, went, he moved to Fairfield, Connecticut, and became a, a businessman and an investor on Wall Street. Now, I need to point out, though, that in, uh, on Christmas Eve of 1867, he married uh, Minnie, his wife Minnie, and uh, Minnie Sackett, and they uh, were happily married. She was a very white blonde Washington socialite, and then it was actually illegal for white people to marry Indians, but nothing was said about it, just a lot of societal gossip. And they uh, lived happily for a long time, in 1878, they had a daughter, Maud, uh, the only child they had. And in 1878, when Maud was born, Ely was 50 and Minnie was 28. Uh, but he had gotten into the uh, real estate and business and Wall Street. He lost most of his money in a collapse on Wall Street. And while he was not hurting, or he was not in poverty, but he was hurting for money, he, in 1876, he got a job with the New York Police Department as a clerk, making $2,400 a year. And he worked there as a clerk with the NY Police Department, NYPD, until his death on August the 30th of 1895. So he was working with the police department when Theodore Roosevelt was with the police department as a commissioner. My son Fred worked with the police department. He knew both of them well. But he was uh, a clerk with the New York Police Department until his death. And uh, in 1890, he developed diabetes got a bad sore on his foot that, that never did heal. He developed uh, blood pressure problems and kidney problems. In fact, what was called Bright's disease, which was a, a combination of uh, kidney ailments. And he began to, to fail in his health the last couple of years of his life, 1893, 94. And by August, of 1895, he, uh, late August, he collapsed in his office at the New York uh, Police Department. His left side was paralyzed. It turned out he'd had several mini strokes over the years, and they, he was carried to uh, the home in Fairfield with friends, and he died there of kidney failure largely on August the 30th of 1895. Originally he was buried there, uh, but some four or five years later, the request was made by the Seneca Indian tribe to move him to Forest Lawn Cemetery in Buffalo, New York, where he was reinterred at the foot of Red Jacket, the great uh, Seneca Indian chief, his great, great grandfather, and he is buried there in the shadow of Red Jacket's grave. So on August the 30th of 1895, his 
a brilliant life came to an end from 1828 to 1895. Lawyer, engineer, uh, extremely erudite, well-educated man, always known to speak in perfect English. Very, very deliberate, perfect English. A very delightful man who was essentially by my side from Vicksburg all the way to the White House and through 1871 when he resigned. Ely Parker, Seneca Indian and Chief. I thought a great deal of Ely. And I hope I've enlightened you as to who Ely Parker was, what he did, and what I thought of him. For the moment, I've said quite enough, and I should bring this reflection to an end. And until next we come together for a reflection, I am Ulysses S. Grant, 18th President of the United States, bidding you a fond farewell.